Holy Spirit, and the Lord has, has I believe it's the Lord, has led me to, um, to continue just to, to talk about the Holy Spirit uh, for, for the next few whatevers, the next few Sundays, or we'll see how long it goes. And today what the Lord has put on my heart is to talk with you about the Holy Spirit and our salvation. What does the Holy Spirit do? What is going on? What does He, what is happening? And there are things, as I was studying it and I was looking at it, there are a lot of things I don't really know either. And I've studied a lot because it's kind of mysterious. But I, I, I want us to look at what the Holy Spirit does in our salvation and His role and His importance. You can't divide it. You can't completely separate it because it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And they all work together in our salvation. They always work together in our salvation, but they have also different roles and different responsibilities even as they work together. And so I'd like us to look, um, I'd like us to be, to, to spend some time today talking about the Holy Spirit and our salvation. In the weeks ahead, we'll talk about the Holy Spirit and our Christian life. How does the Holy Spirit help us as we go day by day? But this morning I want to focus just on the Holy Spirit and our, and our salvation. So by way of reminder, Remember, in the beginning, what happened in the beginning? The breath of God gave breath to man and woman. We've talked about that, and you remember that so well, so I'm not going to give you all the references. That's in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, the story of creation. Uh, I think put me down a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm echoing, right? I'm really loud, yeah? A little bit loud this morning. <laughs> okay. The breath of God gives breath to man and to woman. He makes us. He made man and woman from the dust of the earth. And then he gave breath. Okay, take me back up a little bit now. There we go. Okay. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah, there we go. Okay. The life of God. Imagine that. The life of God lived in man and woman, in Adam and Eve. And then they disobeyed God. A seemingly very simple step. Have you ever thought about that? Sometimes things, choices and decisions seem so small, don't they? God said, don't eat the fruit. And they ate the fruit. What's the big deal? There are plenty of fruit trees in the garden. I suspect because of how God, of God's creativity, and because the climate was perfect at that time, there were no results of sin, I think and I think I'm right, I think that every fruit in the world was in the Garden of Eden. Really, think about that. Must have been such a great place to live. God gave them such a great place to live, right? Think about, what, what's some of your favorite fruits? Just think about that for just a minute. Anybody? Banana. banana. You love bananas. How many types of bananas are there, Ida? So many types of bananas. They were all in the garden. So many types. Somebody else, what's your favorite? Mango. <laughs> Bunch of Filipinos, of course, <laughs> okay. Mango. Think about how many types of mangoes there are. There's the small kidney mangoes. There's those, those other ones. They're the... I don't even know the names. <laughs> those, big, those big round ones that come from Australia, right? Those big ones that are like this big and all these other ones. All those. They were in the garden. What else? Papaya. papaya. Oh, all the different. How many different types of papayas? Many different. It was in the garden. What else? Wh which one? Oh, durian. <laughs> Gloria. Durian. Isn't that great? Durian was in the garden. All the different types of durian. Uh-oh, somebody said something bad about durian, didn't they? Right, I can tell because they're laughing over there. Somebody else, is there, is there a fruit in your country that you don't get in Hong Kong very well? Or it's not very fresh? Okay. A what? Star fruit? Star apple. Okay, star apple. You can't get that very well in Hong Kong? That was in the garden. Anybody else? What? <laughs> oh, persimmons, those big ones. You know there are a lot of types of persimmons as well. Those were in the garden. Those were in the garden. Hey, from Togo, any fruit in Togo that you can't get in Hong Kong? Avocado, avocado but the, the kind of Hong Kong is different. Ah, a special avocado, right? <laughs> 
very uh, kind of juicy. No, not, no, not juicy. Yeah. Uh, sticky. Sticky. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. I think they have some of those in the Philippines, right? Maybe. So there. That was a hey, brother Bono. That was in the garden. That was that was in the garden. How, Alfred? Anyone from your any particular fruit that you just love and you can't get it in Hong Kong very well? What? Can't think of it right now. All of these fruits. All of these fruits. Just think about that. Okay, stop thinking about fruit now. <laughs> okay. So all of it was in the garden. Why did we take a minute and kind of pause and think about all those fruits? All of that was there. They had everything they needed. They could eat all of these things except for that one thing and God said, don't eat that. And they, and they ate it. They disobeyed. Was the poison, was the death in the fruit? No. I think probably the fruit was very, not I think, the Bible lets us know. It looked good and it tasted good too. On the outside, it looked really delicious. And they took a step. So the sin was not in the fruit. The death was not in the fruit. The death was in the disobedience to God. The death was in the disobedience. Brothers and sisters, that's where sin and death always are. It's in the, it's in the step of disobedience to God. It's, it's so often, it's not, oh, that thing in and of itself is a terrible thing. It's in the step of disobedience. It was a small step. What's a big deal? It's just one more type of fruit. And it was a small step that brought death to them and death to all of mankind. It has brought death to you and to me as well. A small step. What's the big deal? Adam and Eve died spiritually immediately. And physically, they began to die. The only DNA they could ever pass on to their children would be DNA that included death and decay. That was the only type of DNA. It, there, was never, there would never be a perfect DNA. Do you wonder why we have cancer? You know, scientists have studied cancer and all the different types of cancer, and sometimes they just don't know. Cells go bad. Cells mutate. Why? I know why. Because Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden took the wrong step and made the wrong choice. And out of that, all of these things have come. All the way up to now. All the way up to now. And ever since then, every parent that's here this morning and every parent in the past could only ever give to their children DNA that has sin and death in it, even up to now. That's why, and we know this already, but that's why, spiritually, it doesn't matter if you've been born into a Christian family. It's great. Hey, by the way, uh, those of you kids here this morning, you've been born into a Christian family, you may sometimes think, my parents drive me crazy. But thank God you've been born into a Christian family. Truly, thank God you've been born into a Christian family. But guess what? All the blessings that come from a Christian family, still, your Christian parents can't give you Christian DNA. They can tell you about God, they can tell you good things, but they can't give you spiritual DNA. They can't give you Christian DNA. That privilege, that power was lost in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned. And only one person can give that back, and that's Jesus. And so, we, as we look at that, I want us to think about God's response to man's failure. So this was in the beginning, in, in, the, in the very beginning of man. I want us to look at God's response to man's failure. We talked about this a little bit, but I want us to think about this a little bit more because I talk with so many people that are kind of angry with God and that have the wrong idea about God and have the wrong thoughts about God. What did God, how did God respond to man's failure? Was he angry? Did he reject? That's what many people think. That's what people still think today, isn't it? When we fall, when we fail. How many of you struggle with the idea when you fail that God is angry with you and he rejects you? He's mad at you. He wants to get away from you. Have you do you struggle with that? I have struggled with that before. I have. We do something and we feel, oh, God's angry at me. He doesn't, he doesn't really love me so much. He kind of loves me because he's God, but he doesn't love me so much because I sinned. 
and he's, he's gone away from me. I want us to look at how God responds to their failure in the garden so that we can see how God responds to our failures today. What's the first thing that God does after they fail? Before, before Andreas puts, clicks it up, what's the first thing? Think about it. This, this is found in Genesis t uh, 2 and 3. What's the first thing? Do you remember? They're hiding, right? They're hiding. Isn't that what we still do today? How many of you? You sin and you fail and you don't want to go talk to God, right? Let's not talk to God for a while. Your name is Adam. Your name is Eve. We're just like our parents, aren't we? We're just like our ancestors. We really are. The first thing that God does is he comes to them and he looks for them. Okay, so you can go ahead and put that one up. He looks for them. The Bible says in the cool of the evening he goes to the garden and he has to have taken human form in some way because he's with Adam and Eve. And what does he do? He calls to them and he says what? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I love that response. God doesn't reject them. God doesn't depart from them. God goes to them. Where are you? Where are you? What is the second thing that God... Uh, sorry, let me be, just before that goes up. I was thinking about that as I was preparing yesterday and I had to laugh. And if I, I'll bet if I talked with some of you who are parents this morning, you would say the same thing. When I was a small child, very small, and I would do something wrong, I always believed that God told my mother and father, but especially my mother. God told my mother what I did. I always knew because she always seemed to know when I'd done something wrong. She always knew it. And I was sure that God spoke into her ear and said, Jennifer has taken five cents out of your purse. <laughs> I, I did that one time. And I, was, I felt so guilty, I almost couldn't breathe, and I had to confess. <laughs> and Mom knew I had done something wrong. She didn't know what I'd done, but she knew I'd done something wrong. And I was thinking about that. I was sure, I was sure that God spoke to my mom and told my mom that what I had done. Years later, I said something to my mom about it, and she laughed, and she said, no, God didn't tell me. God never told me, Jennifer has done something. She said, but you were always so guilty. <laughs> You were acting so guilty. I always knew when you'd done something. And, and that's pretty true, isn't it? It's, especially when you're taught, it's hard to hide. So those of you that you're trying to hide, guess what? Your parents know, okay? Your parents know. And I, I always used to think God has told. Listen, God says, he goes and he looks for them and he says, where are you? Why are you hiding? But you know what? God doesn't really have to ask because he already knows, doesn't he? He already knows. God always knows. He always knows. And he knew what Adam and Eve had done as well. So God looks for them. He goes to them. What else does he do? God was honest with them. God was honest with them. If you go back and read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, especially Genesis 2 and 3, do you know what you will see? You will see God does not shout at them. God does not say to them, You are so bad! Of course they were bad. Of course God was disappointed. Instead, what God said to them was completely the truth, and he was completely honest with them. He said, because you have sinned, because you have eaten the fruit that I told you not to eat, this is what is going to happen to you. This is what your life is going to be like from now on. And you know what? I look at that, and I appreciate that, because you know what? Satan lied to them. When you look at what Satan said to them, Satan said, oh, if you eat the fruit, this is what will happen. And I want to tell you something. Satan always lies. He always lies. Or he'll give you just enough truth so that you like it, so that you believe it. But Satan will never, listen, listen. Satan will never show you the full cost, the full price of the choice you make when you go in his direction. I promise you that. He never, he never lets you know all it's going to cost. Do you know why he doesn't? Because you're not stupid. If you knew 
how much it was going to cost you if you knew the pain and the heartache and the lasting consequences of the choices that you make that go in his direction instead of God's direction, by and large, most people, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do it if we knew, if we knew everything. So he never let you know the full cost. He never, he never let you know the full price. That's one of the differences between God and Satan. God said, this is what it's going to cost. This is what it's going to be. That, this is what it's going to be from now on. What else does he do? What does God do next? God deals with the immediate consequences and their need. What does God do? Adam and Eve, because they've sinned, they're ashamed. They look and they see we're naked. We're not, we're not clothed. For the first time, before sin, there was no shame. There was no, there was no feeling of, of embarrassment about nakedness. There was none of that. And I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. It was only Adam and Eve. There was nobody else. It was just the two of them. It was husband and wife. And still, there was shame at their nakedness. That's what sin does. Sin takes good things. Listen, sin takes good things. Sin takes things like sex, good things that God made, that God made, and he twists it and he messes it up. That's what Satan does. And so what does God do? He looks at them and he sees their need and he sees their nakedness. Listen, and we'll see how far we get this morning. What did Adam and Eve do to cover their nakedness, to cover their sin? What did they do? How did they try to cover themselves? Leaves. Now, the picture they always show you is a fig leaf, but the Bible doesn't say fig leaf. That's something that, we, that artists have thought up. But they tried to cover themselves with leaves. Let me ask you this. Anybody here this morning, have you ever tried to wear clothing made of leaves? How'd that do for you? It doesn't last long, does it? It is inadequate. And what I want us to see this morning is this. Here's the point. Here's the point. The things that you and I do to take care of sin and to take care of the wrong that we have done will never be enough, right? Does that, do you see, do you see that's, that's what's going on in the garden. It will always be inadequate. We look at Adam and Eve and we laugh. They tried to cover up with leaves. They tried to make clothes with leaves. That will last 15 minutes maybe. And so there was a need. But brothers and sisters, we are still the same way today. We sin, we fall, we fail, and instead of going to God for what He will provide us, we try to handle it ourselves, don't we? We try to patch it up ourselves. We try to make it good ourselves. We're just like Adam and Eve. So what does God do in that situation for Adam and Eve? What they have done for themselves is not enough. And so what God does for them is He takes an animal and He kills the animal and he skins the animal, and out of the skin of the animal, he makes clothing for them. And that, at that moment, meets the need that they have. It meets their need. And so to me, as I think about that, and I look at these responses, I see a God of love. Do you see a God of love? Do you see a God of love in the face of failure, in the face of disappointment? Do you think God was disappointed with them? Of course he was. Hey, young people and kids that are here this morning, when you blow it, now sometimes our parents are not perfect, right? Our parents get angry with us, right? Sure. But what hurts more than a parent's anger? Their disappointment, right? Their disappointment. When you see them look at you, all of us, you see a parent look at you and you see the sadness in their eyes because you've disappointed them. <gasps> That's a knife in the heart. That's a knife in the heart when we know we have disappointed and hurt the one that we love and the, the people that we love. And that's true not just parent and child. That's true husband and wife. That's true with friends as well. And God was hurt and God was disappointed. But when we see the response of God, we see a love response, don't we? We don't see an anger response. We don't see a reaction response. We see God coming to them in love. And he kills an animal. I want you to think of something for the first time. For the first time in the garden, 
there was death. Now, Adam and Eve had started to die already, but you know what? Adam and Eve were still standing there, weren't they? I wonder if they felt physically death begin in their bodies. We don't know. We don't know. Maybe they didn't feel that. Probably not. And if you look at the Bible, have you ever looked at the Bible? I think we're going to get maybe halfway through this this morning. Have you ever looked at the Bible and read the genealogies in the beginning? How long did people live in the beginning, in the early years, the early years of the Bible? Hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. In fact, Methuselah lived how long? 969 years. And others lived long, 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 long time. Why do you think people lived so long in the early years? And then if you follow the Bible, they gradually begin the genealogies. What happens? Live a little bit shorter? Little bit, live a little bit shorter? Live a little bit shorter. Why do you think that is? I think it's because of the gradual effects of sin. Because they were still, they'd been made perfect. Death begins in their bodies. Physical death begins in their bodies. But there is still this wonderful perfection, if you will. Here's this wonderful creation that God has made. And so we look at that over time. And that's why I think man continued to live so long. So what did they feel in their bodies physically as they, as they ate the fruit? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But what we do know is this. For the first time, when God took that animal, he had to kill it. For the first time, they saw blood spilled out on the ground. For the first time, they saw pain and suffering. It hurt that animal when God had to kill that animal. There was pain. It wasn't a quiet death. It wouldn't have been a quiet death. What animal was killed? We don't know. Usually we think it was a lamb, don't we? Because of the symbolism. But we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. I think probably it was a lamb. Because what did God do? He took the animal. He killed it. The blood was shed. He skinned it. And then what did he do with that skin? He gave them clothing. He covered their nakedness, the physical nakedness. And what God did for them physically was enough to meet their need, wasn't it? It covered them. That was what they needed. And so he deals with the immediate consequences and their need. We look at that. Why did God take an animal and skin it and the blood was shed to cover, their, to cover what was needed? Most of us, we look at that and we see in that picture a foreshadowing, a symbol of Jesus when he would come. Because one day, Jesus would come and he too would be killed. And he too would shed his blood. Because you and I were naked and ashamed because of sin. Something had to cover the sin. And only the blood of Jesus can cover sin. Only the blood of Jesus. All the religions of the world, all the religions of the world, do you know what they are? They are leaves that people use to try to cover their shame and their sin and their nakedness. Not good enough. All the good deeds that all the people have done in all the world, guess what? They're leaves that people try to use to cover their sin and their shame and their nakedness. All of the giving and the alms and the, and the punishing themselves to show God these things, they are all leaves to cover sin and shame and nakedness. There's only one thing there's, that will cover our sin and our shame, and it's the blood of Jesus Christ. And God showed in the garden this is what I'm doing now, and one day this is what I will do. So brothers and sisters, for me, when I look at God in the garden, I don't see an angry God. I really don't. I see a God of love. Now, God did one more thing in the garden. You say, are we going to get to Holy Spirit and salvation? Yes, we are. Yes, we are, but this is part of it. God did one other thing in the garden. What did he do? He banishes them from the garden. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Pastor Jen. 
This is not a God of love. The garden was a wonderful place. The garden had all these fruit trees. The garden was a place of shelter, and God had given it to them. Why would a good God, why would a God of love now tell Adam and Eve, okay, get out, leave the garden? You see, he really was angry with them. He made them leave. I was right. God is angry. If you go back and read Genesis 3, what will you find? What will you see in Genesis 3? I encourage you later on your own to do that. And you'll, what you'll see is this. God says, now Adam and Eve have eaten, the, have eaten the fruit, they have sinned, they have fallen, and they are now sinful. What was the other tree in the middle of the garden? There were two trees. One was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't eat that one. What was the other tree? The tree of life. The tree of life. And from that tree, they ate continually, and it was a source of eternal life for them. It was a source of eternal life. Were those trees still in the garden? Yes, they were still in the garden. But they had already eaten of this tree, and this tree was still in the garden. So what does God say in Genesis chapter 3? We're not looking at all the verses, because you can look at it later on your own. God says, if they eat from that tree... They will live forever. You say, what's wrong with living forever? You go back and read the words. What would happen if they ate from that tree was they would never die physically, but they would live forever as sinners. They would live forever with sin and death and shame in their lives. They would never have a chance to be redeemed. They would never have a chance to have a relationship with God because of how, because of the choice they had chosen. So what does God do in love? In love, God says, leave the garden. If you read those words a little bit further, do you know what you will see? You will see that the Bible says God drove them out. God drove them out. Do you see that? If you go back, you go back and look. Why does God drive them out? Bona, what do you think? Why does it? Because first he says, leave the garden. And then one verse later, it says, he drove them out of the garden and he put a cherubim, a great angel with a sword to keep them from coming back in the garden. Why would a God of love do that? Why does he have to drive them out of the garden? They don't want to go. No, God. No, God. Don't make us leave. No, God. Let us stay here. No, God. Let us have this type of relationship with you that we have had before. But the price of sin was too great. And it had broken that. And the God of love said, you cannot stay. You cannot stay. And he drove them out. He drove them out. That's a God of love. That's a God of love. That's why when I talk with people, I hope you're convinced of that this morning if you weren't before. If you've wondered, God's angry with me, I've sinned. When all I have to do is look at the first three chapters of the Bible and know that God is a God of love. He's not a God of anger. That's why when I sin, I have confidence to go to God quickly and easily and say, God, I blew it. I am so, so sorry. You don't know the ways I blow it. You think I look so good as I stand here in the pulpit and I'm this and I'm that. I'm just as human as you are. I struggle just as you do. And I know I can go to God. But I also know what sin costs. And so I don't do it lightly. I don't do it lightly because I think of the animal that God killed in the garden and I think of Jesus that I killed on the cross and it makes me careful with sin. It makes me careful with my choices. And so God's ultimate solution was Jesus. This was his immediate solution. I kill an animal to cover you. But that was not a permanent solution. The ultimate solution was Jesus. Jesus was part of God's plan for you and for me. But Jesus was not the only part of God's plan. Who was the other part of God's plan? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And that's why 
on the night when Jesus is resurrected, he comes into the room, and what does he say? And then what does he say? Receive. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. That was part of God's plan. Through Jesus, what does the Holy Spirit do? Did the Holy Spirit... Now, we know it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit die for you? No. Why? Why couldn't the Holy Spirit die for you and for me? The Holy Spirit doesn't have a body. He doesn't have a body. It took a body. It took a human body to bear your sin and my sin. It took a human body. It took human feet to walk up that, up that hill to the cross. It took human hands of flesh and blood to be nailed to the cross. It took that. It took blood, real blood, perfect blood, innocent blood, spilled and poured out for you and for me. So Jesus died for us. But having died for us and his blood is now available to cleanse us and to cover our sin, how is that going to work in our lives? How is that going to be applied to our lives? How I want to simplify it. Please don't take it the wrong way. How does it get from Jesus to you? How does the work of Jesus on the cross come to your life? How is it applied to your life? What happens? Who does it? How does it work out? It is done through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit of, is part of God's plan for salvation. Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples? Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will take what is from me and of me and give it to you. That's what it says in the Word of God. And so Jesus is part of God's plan for salvation, but the Holy Spirit is part of God's plan for salvation as well. So the Holy Spirit takes what Jesus has done and he applies it and he brings it into our lives. So let's look at that in the time that we have left this morning and we'll continue next week. Let's go to the next one. Let's look at, first of all, the Holy Spirit's work before salvation. Are you with me so far? I took a long time on that first part because that's, that's part of it, to understand how God, how God is working. So I want us to look, first of all, at the Holy Spirit's work before salvation. Before the Holy Spirit can ever begin to apply the, what Jesus has done to your life and to my life. He has to do something else first. What work does he have to do? And you can read about it. You can read about the Holy Spirit. But I want us to look at John 16, 8. This is, these are the words of Jesus. He's talking to his disciples that evening up in the upper room. And what does Jesus say to his disciples? When he comes, who is he? Who's he? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict the world of its sin, of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. Now, if you were a business person, you could say, I have a portfolio. How many of you have a portfolio? What is your, if I'm a business person, I would look at you and I'd say, what's your portfolio? What am I asking if I ask you? Brother Kim, if, if I ask you, Brother Kim, what's your portfolio? What would you say? He said, <laughs> he would say technical this and that and whatever. The portfolio is sort of your area of responsibility. The things that you do, right? My portfolio is this. Look with me just a minute. This is the portfolio of the Holy Spirit, okay? This is the, is it his only portfolio? Oh no, oh no. The Holy Spirit has a very, very, very big portfolio. But here is the first thing that we see about the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and coming judgment. Now, I want us to look at this word. He will convict the world. Um, this is the English word, but I want us to look at it in the whole. Here's what the word convict means. Convict means to bring to light, to expose to refute 
and to convince. All of that is bound up in the word to convict. So first of all, when the Holy Spirit comes into the world, he will convict the world. That means you and me before Jesus, okay? That means you and me before the gospel. He will convict us of sin. He will convict the world of sin. Look at this. If this is the Holy Spirit's portfolio, this tells me something this morning. It is not my responsibility to make you feel guilty when you sin. How many of you try to do that sometimes? We've all tried to do it, right? You, you, you're trying to talk to somebody. You want to share the gospel, and you want to, you want to move their hearts. And so uh, Christians are so guilty of this. And so we start talking with this and that, and we want to make people feel guilty so that they will respond to God, right? How many of you have ever done that? Only I have done that, right? I was talking with Sister Betty one time. She said, because Sister Betty became a Christian before her younger sister did. Uh, her younger sister, Cindy, is in heaven now. She, uh, she passed away m many years ago. She was, she was a, a younger sister. And, and um, before Cindy became a Christian, we were all in the church together in the, in the U.S. Dad, m Dad and Mom were their pastors. And Cindy didn't come to church. Cindy hated to come to church. She wasn't a Christian. And if her parents made her come, she would sit in the back of the church like that. She didn't want to be there. But you know what she couldn't stand even more than church? She couldn't stand her sister, Betty. Do you know why? Betty was always trying to make her become a Christian. Be sister Betty would talk with her and she would say, you're going to go to hell if you don't whatever, if you don't do this. And Betty would, would she would kind of beat her over the head with the gospel. Have you ever tried to beat anybody over the head with the gospel? Bong, 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 whatever. And Betty, and Cindy, Betty said that Cindy got to the point where if Betty tried to talk with her, Cindy would just walk away. She couldn't stand it. And years, but years later, but then Cindy did become a Christian at some point. And Betty looked back and Betty told me one time, she said, you know what? If I had just shut up, my sister would have become a Christian much, much earlier. And sometimes that's kind of true, isn't it? Sometimes it's kind of true because Betty was trying to make her become a Christian. The problem was Betty was trying to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. That's his job. That's not your job. Now, you have a job, by the way. You have a job, but that's not it. That's not it. When the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict. What is your job? We'll talk more about this later. But your job is, actually, before you say so much, your job is to live in the right way. That's really the first thing. Because you know what? I can say anything, right? But how I live speaks louder than what I say. And so if people look at my life and they see something different and they see the love of God and they see acceptance and they see humility and they see submission and they see gentleness and they see all of these things, that will speak to them much more loudly. And then when the time comes and I do say something, they may listen. Why? Because I believe it. I've lived it myself. That's how it should be. Really, that's the best way. That's how it should be. And then the Holy Spirit takes how you live, and the Holy Spirit takes your words, when your words match your life, and then the Holy Spirit begins to convict of sin. He does the work of conviction. As I was preparing yesterday, I was reminded of something that happened many, many years ago when I was in Beijing. It was, it was my last year in Beijing. And I was at Peking University, and um, some of you have heard part of this story before. I think many years ago I told it. She was in the English department, and uh, without going into all of the details, um, right near the end of school, the, I think it was my last year at Peking University, the last few weeks at the university, this student of mine came to my room. She wanted to talk with me, and she became, I, I led her to the Lord. She became a Christian, and she really became a Christian. And then I didn't see her over the summer, and then I saw her again in the fall. And what I found out was this young girl, she was a freshman in the English department. She had, uh, the, she came from a broken home. The father wasn't around anywhere, so she had, it was really a sad home life. But over the summer, just in that short time, she led her mother to the Lord, and then she led her big sister to the Lord as well, just in a very, very short time. And, and it was just, the transformation was wonderful. And then when I saw her again, she told me another story. And I was so, I was so moved because her sister was older than she was, and her sister was already working. 
And her sister had become a Christian as well, and they started going to a Chinese, a, a, a house church, a family church, underground church. And there was a guy in the office where the sister worked who really liked the sister. And he kept on, you remember this story? He kept on asking her, let's go out, let's go out. But the sister had become a Christian, and she knew this guy's not a Christian. This, um, he's, he's not interested in God. And she would talk to him about God, and he would laugh at her. And she would talk to him about God, and he would mock her. But he kept on asking her out because he really liked her, and she was really pretty. And she kept on saying no because he didn't have... He didn't have Jesus in his heart. He wasn't, and she knew enough, she'd learned enough to know that the Bible said, don't be joined together with somebody who is different from you, who doesn't, who is not following God. You're not going in the same direction. And so she would say no, and he'd ask her out again, and she would say no. And she'd talk to him about Jesus, and he'd laugh at her, and he'd mock her. This went on for several months. He, she wouldn't go out with him, but she kept on telling him about Jesus. And he kept on asking her, and she kept on saying no. She, she, she refused to missionary date, as, as people sometimes do. And then, one day, he came to work. <gasps> I believe in God. I have become a Christian. What had happened? He told her. Yesterday, I was riding on the bus, going home. He said, and I just looked out. I was just looking as I walked, as I, as I rode in the bus. And he said, and as I looked around, suddenly I was overwhelmed with the feeling that God had made the world. Now that's a big deal for an atheist who has been taught all of his life in evolution and that there is no God. But he said, I, I was convinced I was convicted God had made the world. Because you see, he had believed lies all of his life. And the Holy Spirit exposed the lies. He said, and then I was overwhelmed with the knowledge, I am a sinner. I'm a sinner. That, that, that's the word that he used. Now, those of you that aren't Chinese, especially if you don't have a mainland Chinese background, you don't really understand what that means. Because in Chinese, when you say you are a sinner, when I used to talk to mainland Chinese in China, you would use the word 罪人, 罪人. But in Chinese, that means what? Criminal. It means criminal. That's what I, and so when I would talk with people in China and talk with them about God, they would always say, but I'm not a criminal, because in their minds they would think murderer, rapist, thief, kidnapper, and things like that. Really, really. Because the word in the Bible is very specific. It's sin. And to, to, they would say, I'm not a criminal. I'm not a criminal. But that's the word that he used. And he said, I realized I am a sinner. I'm a criminal. That's the word that he used. And because of that, he gave his heart to the Lord, and he became a Christian. I don't remember the full end of the story, but as far as I remember, they began dating, <laughs> and they got married. I think that's what I remember. I think that's what I remember. But you know what? That's not really the best part of the story, is it? The best part of the story is that someone who was going to hell was now going to go to heaven. Brothers and sisters, how did it happen? It happened because the Holy Spirit did His work of conviction. The Holy Spirit did His work of conviction. That's His job. That's what He does. That's what He does. We're, we're not going to get as far as the next slide, so I want to, I want to, I'm, I'm going to come to a close this morning, but I want to tell you one other story this morning as we come to a close, and we'll pick up from here next week. I think of this story with such great joy, but I think of another story with such sadness. Because you see, the Holy Spirit convicts, the Holy Spirit convicts, and then people have to do something. People have to respond. When there is true conviction, listen carefully, when there's true conviction, you cannot ignore it. Can't You cannot ignore it. If there's no true conviction, it's easy just to ignore it. You know, if you may go to a church or you may go to a service where there's no move of the Holy Spirit, there's no feeling of the Holy Spirit at work, and it's easy to listen to a, a sermon. It's easy to listen to words, but there's no change in the heart, right? 
But when the Holy Spirit is working, you have to choose. And you have to choose this way or this way. You can't ignore. And I remember, this is the other story. We had two friends, Betty and I did. We had a group of friends. They were all older. They were almost our age at that time. And they were all university prof professors at Peking University. And one of our best friends was in the international politics department. Brilliant young man. He was a lecturer at the university. And he and his wife became friends with us. And we would spend all the time together. We would spend every Sunday evening, we'd cook together in our home. He was a great cook, and they'd cook, and they'd pour MSG and oil <laughs> and whatever, and we'd eat, and we'd eat together, and we had such a good time together, and we'd always talk about Jesus. We'd always talk about Jesus, and we'd talk about politics and things like that. We always had a great time, but we'd always talk with them about Jesus, and they would listen, and they'd listen, and they'd listen, but they weren't, they weren't convicted. They weren't convicted until one Friday eve, Friday afternoon, it was a Friday afternoon, they were seated in our living room, we were talking, and at that moment, the Holy Spirit convicted them. It was so clear. We looked at their faces. I could see on their face. They know it's true. Before they had listened to us because we were friends. Oh, it's interesting. We like to discuss religion. We like to discuss theories. But this afternoon, they listened and they knew it's true. The Holy Spirit brought to light. And as they listened, we saw their faces begin to change. And we talked. And, and in our hearts, and then they went, they went home. They didn't do anything at that moment we, because they were, they were very, very, really analytical. And we said, so you need to think about it. You've got to make a decision. And they said, yes, we do. Yes, we do. And our hearts were so overjoyed. We were so happy. We thought, praise the Lord. I won't tell you their names. I still know them so well. We thought, praise the Lord. After two years of witnessing and spending time together and sharing the gospel, they are going to accept the Lord. I mean, both of them were Communist Party members. Of course, of course they were Communist Party members. We knew that. And they went home that weekend and they said, we will come back on Monday. We were so happy. We were so excited. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit has broken through their hearts and their lives. They're going to become Christians. They came back on Monday and they made it very, very clear that they had made a decision and they were not going to follow God. They didn't say it in detail. But it was very clear. They were Communist Party members. If they followed God, they would have to give that up. If they followed God, they would possibly lose their teaching position at the best university in China. If they followed God, they would lose their opportunity to go to America to study and to teach and to work. And they knew and they chose another way. And my heart, when I tell you that, is still broken. I hope maybe they've chosen God sometime later. But there's no guarantee that they did. They had to choose. And they knew it was true. And so as we come to a close this morning, I don't want to just leave you with stories about other people because the Holy Spirit convicts us as well. He convicts us as well. Our hearts can be moved. We may cry a few tears. We may think about it a lot. And the devil is fine with that. He really, the devil is fine if you kind of cry a little bit this morning. The devil is fine with it this morning if you kind of say, I'm going to try to do better. That was a really good sermon. Yeah, I really liked that. The devil says, that's fine. That's okay with him. Because that's not a change in God's direction. The devil says, you can do any of those things. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us, and when he speaks to our hearts, and we know it's true about an area of our lives, you got to do something about it. You are going to do something about it. And you say, no, not now. Well, then you've done something about it. Or you say, now, yes. And so I want to give you, as we close this morning, just an, an opportunity to respond to the Holy Spirit. So I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes. And it may be for salvation this morning, or it may be an area in your life that you've been choosing in a particular way and you need to choose something different. 
I'm not going to belabor the point or say, you must choose now, hell is ahead. That's, that's not my job. The Holy Spirit is speaking to your hearts this morning. So would you, in just this minute or two right now, would you respond to the Holy Spirit right now? Just, you can whisper to Him, you can pray, you know that God is not angry with you, you know that God loves you, you know that God has provided something to meet this need in Jesus. If you're not a Christian this morning, I urge you to listen not to my words, but to the words and the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's really simple. Everybody here, we know enough. God, I come to you. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I let go of the leaves that I've been trying to cover up myself with. And I receive the blood of Jesus shed for me. Or maybe you're a Christian already and there are some areas of your life you know the Holy Spirit has been talking to you about those areas. You know it. What are you waiting for? Why are you putting it off? Take care of it now. Let Him take care of it now. Because He will. God provides for your need. And the Holy Spirit is here to work in your life, to work in my life, to, to take care of that area. This is why He came. This is why He's here. Holy Spirit, we say yes to you. Jesus, we say forgive us. We have been resisting and we don't want to anymore. Please help us. But we can't do it by ourselves. You're going to have to help us. You're going to have to do it. Because I've been trying by myself and it's not enough. I confess. I repent. I receive your help. And I choose to walk in your ways with your help in your power. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for having your part in my salvation, for having your part in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.